Um, I'm delighted to be here uh, on behalf of Turkish Wines, talking about Turkish Wines. Um, I have a little history with Turkey, which I might talk a bit later, but uh, I guess I want to start by talking about, um, I think Turkey for many of us in the UK is familiar but possibly unfamiliar at the same time. But let's, look, let's look at the map for a start. Now, you can look at Turkey, if you like, as a peninsula sort of sticking out from the edge of Asia. But I think it may be more useful to think of it as a bridge between Asia and Europe. Um, the two continents are divided, I'm going to point on the your finger, um, by the Sea of Marmara here, uh, the Bosphorus here, the Black Sea, and the Dardanelles Straits here. Um, and I think in lots of ways, geographically as well as politically and culturally, there, I think Turkey still is a real bridge between Asia and Europe. There's more than 8,000 kilometers of coastline. You've got the Black Sea all the way up on the top, a little bit of the Sea of Marmara, uh, the Aegean here along the down in the south, the Mediterranean. So that's a long coastline that does tend to have um, some effect on the climate. As well, we mustn't forget that actually part of Turkey is actually in Europe. Thrace, which is this, this area obviously to the north of the Sea of Marmara, and that, there, there's the border there. Um, in fact, Thrace is quite an, uh, an important um, wine grain region. And the rest of the bulk of Turkey is, is often called Anatolia. Um, Turkey actually, uh, for many of us, Turkish wine is quite a new thing, but in fact, there's a bit of a history here. Um, going back to the um, 1900s, you can see these posters, um, and maybe you'll notice uh, the French on the left-hand one. Um, the French still have a big influence. There's a lot of French winemakers and consultants running around Turkey today. But before that time, the time, well, in the Ottoman time, in fact, about that time, um, there, was a, there were hundreds of millions of litres of wine being made in Turkey. Um, they exported wine to France even. Then you had a series of wars, the Balkan Wars, the First World War, the end of the Ottoman Empire, and there was a lot of disruption, particularly in that area, uh, that European area of Turkey, and also in the Aegean. Um, and many vineyards were abandoned. When the Turkish Republic came into being, uh, Ataturk, uh, Father Turk, was very, was very supportive. He wanted to modernise Turkey, and one of the things he was keen to support was wine production. So we have a situation today where Turkey has the fifth largest vineyard area in the world. Now, a lot of that isn't going to wine, a lot of that's table grapes. Um, it may surprise you that Turkey is the founder member of the OIV. And um, what those posters, I guess, tell you was there was a time uh, when the government supported wine. Um, these days, it's not quite the same, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, I think, it, it, in fact, what, what's impressive to me is that the, the strides forward that the industry is making, despite the fact the government isn't terribly supportive. I want to just quickly talk before we move on as well about um, a little bit about going further back in history. Um, there's a lot of talk of where, uh, where, where did wine cultivation start, where did wine making start. Um, and if you read the fantastic wine grapes uh, book, they're suggesting that in fact there's a fertile triangle. Uh, Ampelographers, botanists, uh, geneticists all seem to think this, this sort of vast upland area um, between the Taurus Mountains in Turkey, the Zagros Mountains in Iran, and the Caucasus, which is Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. And it would appear that if you look at wild varieties still in existence and cultivated traditional varieties in the area, it would appear that southern Anatolia may well be the birthplace of viniculture, so growing grapes and making wine. Um, they even, um, in the wine grapes, they even bring in the marvellous um, subject of glottochronology, which is about studying language, and it would appear this area was also uh, the, really the home of all of the Indo-European names. So we've got, a, we've got a case here for lots of modern civilization starting here. To be fair to wine grapes, they do suggest that uh, it's not a done deal. While they think that this is where cultivation started in southern Anatolia, the Caucasus may still have an argument to be made, and the Georgians certainly can tell you that they have the longest tradition of winemaking in the world. The longest continues. Uh, here's some pretty pictures of Istanbul. Um, the, wine, the domestic wine market in Turkey is very much dominated by um, urban areas, particularly Istanbul and Izmir. And certainly more, it's also in the west rather than the east. Uh, as you go further east, uh, people become a little more conservative and uh, less interested in drinking alcohol. Although there are actually things that people do drink it. Uh, maybe they do it a little bit quietly. Uh, here's, a, here's a map just showing you some of the um, 
region. So, as we've seen, it's transcontinental between the deserts of, of Arabia and its eastern neighbours, uh, the seas of, of Eastern Europe, and there is quite a lot of climatic variation. The coastal regions in the west tend to have a, a temperate Mediterranean climate, a hot, dry summer, mild, wet winters. Uh, in the north, by the Black Sea, um, you have high humidity, maybe hotter summers and cold winters. In the interior, it's much more continental. You've got quite a diurnal temperature difference. Uh, you get a lot of snow for four months of the year. Uh, so you've got, you've got a really diverse range of terroirs to play with. In fact, a lot of it is still relatively uncharted. And of course, because we're in a, um, a zone where um, tectonic plates um, collide, Turkey is quite mountainous. Um, really, there's not a huge amount of flat land, although the Anatolian plateau is relatively flat. You've got seven uh, geographical regions here. If you look at the wines of the website, they don't quite, they, they slightly differ, but we'll, we'll, we'll work on this one. Um, so we've got Marmara, and that's this area, that purple mode area um, in, in the northwest. Uh, you've got three seas, the Black Sea to the north, uh, the Aegean to the south, and the Marmara itself, which is quite a big sea. Uh, the Mediterranean here, hot summers, mild winters, this maritime influence, maybe some sea breezes. Um, a reasonable amount of rain, somewhere between 400 and 1,000 millimetres a year. On average, it's probably just perhaps maybe 550. Can be quite humid. Uh, in this area down here, the Gallipoli Peninsula, uh, you can have um, a more pronounced maritime influence. It's a little bit cooler. Um, and also in the northern part, going up of Thrace, going up towards the Bulgarian border, it can be a little bit cooler too. Uh, all kinds of soil types here. There's some lime, there's some gravelly loam, and there's quite a lot of clay. About 14% of Turkish wine comes from this region. The Aegean is that sort of dull coloured area um, to the south of there. It's the western part of Turkey facing the Aegean Sea and the Greek islands. Again, quite um, typical Mediterranean hot summers. That's why we go on holiday there, because we don't have hot summers in this country. Um, again, there's some maritime influence. There's always there's quite a few breeze in the afternoon. Um, in the coastal parts, vineyards tend to be quite low, about maybe up to 150 metres. So you could say maybe it's a little bit more like Bay in, in southern Italy or, or Athens. Um, and as you move inland towards the Anatolian Plateau, uh, you can have vineyards up to about 900 metres. Uh, climate is a little more maybe Roman Valley-like, uh, with less rainfall. Mediterranean region, uh, this sort of uh, garish acid yellow at the bottom there. Um, surprise, quite Mediterranean climate, it's quite typical. Hot summers, um, mild winters. Again, some maritime influence. A fair amount of rain, about 500 millimetres a year. Um, so you can have heavily clay loam, you can have calcareous chalks, but there's not much wine actually produced here. Central Anatolia is strongly continental. Um, you have some, a little bit of subtropical influence from the north, um, from the Black Sea, um, and in Cappadocia you have a sort of step climate, which is very snowy and what you might call killing frosts. Black Sea along the north coast, um, it's a little bit of a transition between that subcontinental and, and, and uh, sorry, that continental and subtropical influence. It can be quite stormy, and as you go inland, it can be quite hot. Tokat uh, is an area that's uh, interesting, particularly for white grapes, and we'll, we've got a wine with it. Comes to the um, as you go higher, uh, the climate can become a little more extreme. So it's in some ways a tricky place to grow. Uh, Eastern Anatolia um, is an area that uh, many Turks don't go to. Uh, I've been there. Uh, it's, it's really it's fantastic. Um, you have there's probably the best known there is called Elazin. Uh, it's continental, but there are moderating influences from lakes, particularly around Elazin. It's quite high. So a thousand meters, you've got red clay, granite, light chalk and clay as well. And then the southeast, bordering um, Iraq and Syria, not a place that many of us want to go now. Um, it's quite rough, it's dry. Um, I know some of you may know Tanat and he went out there to, to visit some people once and when they went out to, to visit the vineyards they had someone with them with a gun, uh, which gives you an idea about the, the, the current climate. Um, What's interesting about these two areas is some really in, there are some uh, old varieties being discovered, uh, and we'll, we'll look at that a bit more as we go along. So th this um, slide gives you a sense of 
um, some of these varieties. So we trace your, if, if, as you, I'm not sure if you can read that, but you're tending to find um, more European varieties like Cabernet Franc, Gamay, Sanso, Simeon, but also Merlot and Cabernet. Um, uh, and there's, we, we see these other grapes of Ara Caraza, uh, Papa Caraza, and more and more, there's, uh, what's the other one I'm just going to forget now, but you're beginning to see more indigenous grapes uh, in Thrace. It is here, which is uh, here, again, mostly um, international varieties like Cabernet, Grenache, Shiraz, Merlot and so on. Uh, the Nisli, slightly further to the east, uh, you're beginning to see some of these indigenous grapes like Kalachik Karaza, Akuskuzu and Bayaskare. Uh, Manisa near there, Carignan, Sultania, Alicante, and so on. And as you go further west, you're getting more and more of the native rice. So here at Alazik, uh, there's a Kuskuzu, and Tokat up here in the Black Sea region, uh, Naranje, and around Ankara, we have Kalachit Karaza. And I'll talk a little bit more about those as we go along. Um, before we go on to talk about the grapes themselves, I'd just like to tell you a little bit of mine. My experience of Turkey, um, when I was a young man, I spent a long time being a bum, and I sailed a lot, and I ended up running a flotilla in Turkey. Um, and I can tell you, we drank beer, because the wine wasn't very good. It wasn't terrible, but it wasn't very good. And at the end of the, end of the season, we went right across to the, to the Far East, and our church friends said, why would you want to go to Anatolia in the snow? And it, but it was, it was incredible. So I was delighted to be asked back in 2010 to judge a Turkish wines competition. I've been, since then, I've been back three times to judge Turkish wines. And my observation is that Turkish winemakers are becoming more confident in what they do. There's still a lot of international varieties. Uh, we, one of the fantastic things about the competition we, we did there was we had a feedback session. Sometimes it's quite painful and the brave people come and listen. Um, and sometimes some people don't want to hear what we have to say, and other people come and listen, they think we're full of rubbish. But what I, what I, I think there's a couple of things. One is that originally I think you found that international varieties, particularly red ones, had lots of oats thrown at them. And the Turkish varieties often, in a way, even though maybe they weren't technically as good wines, but to me they were more interesting because they were Turkish and they weren't swamped in oak. One of the challenges I think Turkish winemakers face in the domestic market is that it, mostly they're relatively new wine drinkers and people, when they're new, like big. They like overlap alcohol. And as someone said to me recently, it's a country where people drink raki. And so if you switch from raki to wine, you don't want some wimpy, light wine. You want something with power and, and, and so on. And so, so there's a tension there between people like me going to Turkey and saying, we want less oak, we want less alcohol, you know, we want more Turkish varieties, and the domestic market wanting international varieties and wanting power and, and oak and so on. So I think that, that, that's a sort of a debate, if you like, that's still going on. I would say, after my fourth trip this year, I would say that uh, where wines are using new oak, it's mostly being used better. Um, it's not like, you know, as we say, munching on a mental piece. You actually can taste the grapes. And the, oak, the oak's present and the oak's there, and that, then you can decide whether, whether you like But I think the wine actually has better balance. And we're seeing more of these, these international varieties. So I think, um, for me, it's, Turkey has got to the stage where it's not just a curiosity. I mean, I still, still for many consumers, to see a Turkish wine on a wine list will be, oh, really? Do they make wine in Turkey, kind of thing? But I think there are, there are genuinely Turkish wines that can compete in a tough international marketplace like London because they're interesting and there's quality there. So hopefully that's what we'll find in the tasting. Just to look at um, this, again, this just gives you another sense of, of these great varieties. What's interesting here is I've mentioned, or I'll, I'll, I'll go into a bit more detail about some of the Turkish varieties, but we are beginning to see um, varieties um, that have been recovered, if you like. Like over here, I built the Karasakis, which is the, the chewing gum grape. Um, and maybe it's not the greatest grape in the world, but it's interesting. And it's, it it's makes a relatively light style wine, and, and, and it's interesting. So I think that's that's fantastic. Of course, the Christmas Zoom and Bias today, and I'll talk about those in, in, in a moment. But you have things like Rumi and uh, Dokul, Yen, and so there's all these things that I, to be honest, I've never tasted. So again, Turkish winemakers are beginning to go, we have the stuff that no one else has. And so I think we will see um, more of those varieties appearing. The challenge maybe is that um, 
we find some of these ones, these grapes hard to pronounce. And of course, I think the classic, but Akushkadu has more umlauts in one word than I've ever seen. And of course, for English speak, we don't, we're not really into diacritical marks. So I think the umlauts put us off to begin with. In fact, it's not such a difficult thing to pronounce. But we'll, we'll, we'll get there when we get there. So let's look at these, the most important um, Turkish grapes. Narinjan uh, means delicately, and um, it's mostly grown in Turkey, so uh, along the um, Yeshil Irman River, so in the, in the Black Sea region. It's one of the most important uh, white varieties in Turkey because it's also widely planted as a table grape, and you will find that a lot of these wine grapes are also grown as table grapes. And of course, there's a bit of a challenge there because if you're growing grapes at the table, uh, you're probably looking at big fat grapes, and if you're trying to grow grapes for wine, maybe you're looking at slightly smaller berries and um, maybe just lower yields. So there will always be tension with growers there. Mostly grown on sandy, uh, gravelly soils. It's generally grown really to be high, maybe six, seven hundred meters. Um, and it's it's mostly found in that area of Turkey. Generally speaking, um, it can, it's it's fresh and fruity, sometimes oaky, sometimes off dry. It can be full bodied. People tend to find citrus flavors like orange and grapefruit, uh, maybe something floral and, and apple and lime. Um, and it's probably in terms of ageability, it's probably the most important white grape or native grape in Turkey, I think. It's also uh, a useful blending grape, and we've got a wine for you to look at um, as we go along. The Sultania uh, is the Sultana grape. Um, it's mostly a table grape, generally grown in Denizli and, and Minsa, so that's, that's in the Aegean region. Um, it doesn't make wine with a huge amount of personality, but these days with modern, modern winemaking, it's giving them nice, easy to drink, light, fruity wines, um, and we've got one for you to try. Emir comes from Cappadocia, so that's right in, in the center, if you like, of Anatolia. Um, wines, it often used for making sparkling wines, uh, not particularly heavy, it's got fairly high acidity, so again, that suits um, sparkling wine making. Not a lot of color. Um, Likes the continental climate, light height, so you can you can find this growing up to 1,200 meters. Um, so that, that that's one to look out for. Then we have the first of the reds, uh, Kalachik Karaza, comes from the area just around Ankara or northeast of Ankara. It's the certainly the most important red wine variety in central Anatolia. It was almost wiped out by Phylloxera in the 60s, recovered um, by the University of Ankara and the Calacli Dairy Wine Company. And in fact, their first variety wine was only produced in 1989. So I think this is a grape that um, has, has definitely got some future and we've seen it yet. Vines tend to be 600, 900 meters maybe above sea level. Um, they're getting up to about 3,500 hectares in total plantings. And because of its success in Anatolia, it's beginning, people are beginning to plant it uh, in other places um, further west. Best examples may smell, people sometimes find it a bit candy, but people, you can also find sour cherry, raspberries. It's not particularly heavy, uh, it's got quite soft tannins. Uh, it works really well as an unopened wine style. People sometimes say, it's like Pinot Noir, but maybe in some ways, maybe it's a little bit more like Gamay, like it doesn't have the colour of Pinot Noir. So it's, if you think of that sort of um, Pinot Noir, Gamay kind of zone, that, that's where it is. Unfortunately, we haven't got one today, but I can guarantee there'll be some uh, next door to taste. Next one up, the Kuskazu. Just say a few times, you'll be able to get the end of it. It's not that hard. And it means bullseye. And I, I do think um, maybe that's a way of, of selling it to consumers. I think you can almost put bullseye on the label. That sounds great. Um, it originates in Alizé, in uh, eastern Anatolia. Uh, the reason it's called um, uh, bullseye, by the way, is it's big blackberries. Um, it's one of the most important Turkish red grapes. Like Naranje, it's grown for the table as well as for grapes. Um, it's mostly planted on sandy clay, on limestone, but there's red clay, there's all granite, all kinds of things. Quite high, 850 to 1100 metres above sea level. Um, it's not particularly dark in colour. It's medium body, it's quite juicy. You have the, it's quite aromatic and fruity. Um, not particularly acidic, not particularly tannic. So it's often blended with Waiskare, which is much more tannic. So it's, you, you'll see it on its own, and you will see it as a blend. And I think it's, it's a really quite an exciting grape. It's also, not having said that, not particularly um, age-worthy. I mean, you can age a bit, but you really need to have old wines. Waiskare, 
Um, this is the, the last of the, the, the big three, if you like, root grapes. This one comes from Diabakia in the southeast. It's now being grown across Anatolia, in Cappadocia and in, in uh, the Aegean. People sometimes see it as being similar to Nebbiolo or Tanna, and the, the common thing there is Tanna. It's got plenty of it. Um, it's potentially age-worthy. Um, it doesn't have particularly high acidity, unlike, say, Nebbiolo, which has acidity and Tanna. Um, I think maybe people's first experience, if you've, had, if you've ever had it before, it may have been a little bit rustic, a little bit tough. These days, winemakers are getting better at viticulture, better at physiological ripeness, better at winemaking, and so I think there, there, are, there is some real interest. And as I mentioned with the previous grape, this is the one that um, made sometimes the blend of Couscousou and Bayasque is actually the, the winning combination. So, question so far. Let's taste some wine. Now I'm going to just keep you on your toes. We're going to change the tasting order slightly. What I'd like to do is to start with number two. For you by Bella Milo Sotanye. So this one comes from Denizli, which is in the Aegean area. Not huge yarrow, but that's, that's pretty much what you expect from, from this grape. This is a Pumukale Nose Naranje. So this comes from the, uh, uh, from Guna again, um, uh, in the west of Turkey. So we're in Denizli, and of course Denizli uh, is really, it's the province uh, near the Mediterranean. has had a little bit of time, you know, on, on leaves. There's nice texture, I think. This, for me as an example, I was talking before about oak. I think the oak's been used really well here. Oak's giving you texture giving you, and an extended leaves context giving you richness without the wine being particularly open. Like for me that's a really positive element here. There is something lightly floral there, maybe a little bit of orange peel. Of course when you do oak age, um, you tend to gain texture at the expense of um, variety of expression. I think sometimes if you have unoaked um, nanje, maybe that orange peel carrot is more pronounced. And this is a very respectable 12.5%, and, and I think that's also, um, for me, really promising. We don't have to have blockbuster levels of alcohol. Three. Number three is the third one we're going to taste. Um, 
This is the Google Sermon Monk. This is from um, Threats from Tech and Dad. Uh, this is where I was a couple of months ago in, in uh, judging a competition. Um, course for New Zealander to discuss uh, Sermon Monk from Turkey is quite a challenge. <laughs> What I like about this wine is it smells like Samuel. <laughs> You're in no doubt with Samuel Bond. Um, and I, I, I think that's positive. The, the truth is that um, consumers in this country, certainly not, not just this country, really like the aromas and flavours of Samuel Bond. And I think this is definitely going for lots of expression, lots of aromatic expression. It's at the right end of the spectrum, but I don't think it's overripe. So this is the Deluja Palma Chardonnay Naranjé. So the Chardonnay comes from Denizli. Let's get that to the next. So Denizli is about here. And that's 70%. And 30% of the wine is Naranjé from Tokat up here. 12 months aging uh, in a mixture of French and American oak. Gives you, it, it gives you texture. There's that little, little bit of reduction we like to call minerality. Um, the the nanjie gives you a little bit of, a little bit of a fruity kick in there. I think this is a really lovely blend. So you could, you could, to me, it sort of, it sits nicely between being Turkish and being international. It's a wine that I think um, the Turks should be able to sell in export markets because it's it's really well made, it's really stylish. But it has something because it's got this chunk of nutting in it. To me, it still has something to say about being Turkish, and I and I, I really do like this one. Almost 14% alcohol, but I think it wears that alcohol really nicely. There's enough richness, there's enough texture, and the balance is lovely. And it's 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 got that nice acidity. You no, know, it is it's, it's lip smacking. Really nice wine, I think. Okay, on to some red wines. I think we might stick with the order now. So number five is number five. This is the Mosaic Maran Ribo Petrovito. Who can tell me what Ribo is? Anyone? I had to look it up <laughs> the first time I had this. Uh, it's actually a cross uh, that comes um, from Trentino and it's Merlot and Teroldigo. Um, it's It can give uh, quite rich uh, full body wines um, and it likes barrels. So it's blended here with a piece of a dough. Um, and these, the, both the grapes are grown um, from Urla, which is here in Izmir. <laughs> Eighteen-month barrel aging, and all the oak was used. Third and fourth use. I think 
what I like about this wine is that the Rivo seems to obtain the Petit Verdot. The Petit Verdot is used almost like seasoning in Bordeaux because it's quick and ripe and ripens late. But it does give you perfume, it gives you acidity, it gives you tannin. So it's, it's, it's a, a great, it's full of character. And we're beginning to see Petit Verdot planted in warmer places. You're seeing it in um, central Spain, you're seeing it in Australia. You see uh, some of it in um, Western, Western Turkey. And, and I think, for me, sometimes it flips over from being this sort of um, character, a tough guy, to being a monster. I think it's really easy to be over the top. And what I like about this wine is this, it's got structure, it's got bite, it's got grip, it's got all those things, but it's a really lovely, juicy wine. It's, it's, it's got freshness to it, it's not overripe, which for me is really important. Um, 14%, so plenty of alcohol, but again, alcohol's not free, it's not too high. So a lovely sort of savoury note, I'm not, I'm not sure if that's from the Pete Bernal or from the Rebo. I think this is a wine that maybe we wouldn't, we, we, would we age Turkish wines? I would say why not? But I think it's hard maybe to get people to think about Turkish wines as a wine age. I think there's an upfront fruitiness and juiciness that you could drink this, but I'd like to see it served in a decanter and maybe alternately given um, a few years more bottle age. I think really um, encouraging. And it's interesting to see this great rebo. You know, it's, I, I'm not sure I've consciously tasted one until I tasted this wine in Turkey a few a couple of months ago. Okay, uh, on to number six. This is Gali Centiri Merlot Cabernet Franc. Uh, all the grapes are grown in Gallipoli. And remember, so we're, we're uh, here in the Marmara region, but we've got that definite um, uh, maritime influence, which, and, and which gives us cooler breezes and a bit of freshness in the grapes. There's something that says Cabernet Franc to me, you know, there's that slight little hint of leafiness, it's not overt greenness, but something slightly herbaceous and leafy. And I, I, I do think, a little bit like Petit Verdot maybe, Cabernet Franc has become a bit of a fashionable break around the world, and I think it gets used and abused rather too much. I think people throw new barrels at it and they push the ripeness levels, and I think for me, part of the interest of Cabernet Franc is that it, it has that, it sits up, it, the best thing for me sits on the edge of ripeness. It's not, un, I don't want unripe Cabernet Franc, but I don't want overripe Cabernet so, so that little hint of, of leafiness for me is really appealing. Again, a wine I would really like to, to put away for a few years in the cellar, give it a bit of a chance. But I think those towns need to, the flavours are lovely, but I think those towns need a little bit more time to integrate in the wine. Again, um, the reality is certainly if we're trying to serve this wine in restaurants, it these days everybody needs to sell their wine, but I think, I think I'd like to see this wine in the decanter and maybe uh, <laughs> people might be a bit shocked at the idea of putting Turkish wine in the decanter, but I think it, that, that, that the aeration of what this wine really needs, but I think it's excellent wine. On to number seven. Selendi, Sanic, Shiraz. This is um, uh, from Manisa, the province in the Aegean region. So we're sort of between Antalya on the coast and Ankara, but slightly closer to the coast. We're on a plateau, we're about 800 metres above sea level, uh, with a lovely climate for vineyards. And they harvest in September, which is reasonably late. You know, if you, um, 
down on the coast, you can find, in the middle of summer, you can find, uh, as I have, temperatures of 40 degrees during the day. But as you move away from the coast, as you go up, it definitely gets cooler. So after the end of September, means you've got a pretty decent growing season. So you can have proper physiological ripeness. This had 18 months of medium toast French oak. sit somewhere between France and the New World. It's got, it, it's maybe a bit riper than you might expect from the Rhone Valley, but it's not full on like maybe South Australia. Um, quite spicy, quite peppery, plenty of tannin. Maybe at this stage of life you can taste a little more oak tannin. There's a, there's a bit of a stringency there. Um, but I, I think a really good example of uh, modern Shiraz or Syrah grown in Turkey. Mm. Quite a lot of character and depth, concentration, but at this stage of life it's a bit of a bruiser, isn't it? <laughs> Not sure I'm retiring at all. Okay. On to number eight. I should mention actually, it's one, one thing, this is, this is from Cairo, which is one of the, if you like, the big four companies in Cairo, I think it used to be the state, the state owned company and it's privatised now. And one of the encouraging things I've seen in Turkey is, is we have lots of what you might call boutique producers uh, doing really interesting things. But the big companies have all adjusted it, and I, I think it, for me that's really exciting that um, you know they, they, maybe they have a slightly different agenda, they, they make bigger volumes, but all of the big companies are capable of making good wine in Turkey, and I think that's really encouraging. So this is a couscousu uh, from from Aydin in Alazet. So we're in, we're over here. I made the glass, I almost think I'm in Italy. And I'm trying to think what it is that makes me think of Italy. There's definitely some spice and something exotic there. Merlot, Syrah, Cabernet Sauvignon. So, 
In fact, Volo, I think, is, is more as the Greek name for Ulla, isn't it? No, no, it was the name of Ulla 400 years ago. Ah, okay, here we go. Uh, it was, it, did it mean marshland or something like that? Sorry? What would it mean? Did it mean marshland? I don't mean marshland or it's swamp. Yeah, it's bushy the, or whatever. I don't know. It's not. It's a name. I yeah, mean, it's oh, not we'll have a name. name. Yeah. Okay, so we have a name. So maybe yeah, it's me. This is the man who owns it, by the way. As you might guess. Okay. So, in fact, when John bought this land, you discovered your vineyards maybe a thousand years old, or potentially a thousand years old. So, it's, so I think there is a sense for me in, in Turkey of kind of rediscovering the history, um, and, and and it's exciting. And lots of people, when, when you when you meet Turkish winemakers, they're 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 really pushing pushing going back, looking backwards. And I don't mean looking to make old-fashioned wine, but looking back at the history. And I think lots of people have been playing around with. Um, international varieties, and then people find that they've got something on their doorstep in some cases, which may have not may have been used for making wine. And so I think there's, there really is a sense of discovery in the table that's really exciting. This one's had 10 to 12 months in French oak. I think on your tasting sheet you've got a proportion of grapes in here. Again, you know, I think this is, an, this is an, an ambitious wine. It's got structure, it's got bite, it's got tannin. Maybe not. I think the tannins are really nicely, um, nicely extracted and nicely worked. Maybe the previous one seems slightly more angular than this, but it's still got a fair amount of tannin. It's got a decent amount of acidity. It's got 14.5% alcohol. I think it carries it really well. I'm always moaning about alcohol. I probably moaned the jar in the past about <laughs> too much alcohol. But actually, I think this wine works. I mean, it's 14 and a half, it's not too high, it's, it's, it, it's got lots going on, uh, it's a really interesting blend, international Turkish varieties, so I think for me, maybe that's, um, it's a really good way for me to end this case, I think this, this shows you what Turkey can do where people are playing around with international, playing around with native there, um, and I think, I think actually this wine probably reflects where it comes from now, the fact is, sometimes when we, people like me bang on about alcohol, in fact some places, you know, you get high alcohol. And I think if, if the viticulture is good enough and the winemaking is good enough, you can handle that and you can achieve a wine that's really balanced and says something about where it comes from. On that note, I'm going to end because there's a whole lot of wine in there for you to taste. Um, we haven't, we, we, we've just touched on this. There's another session this afternoon that Sarah Abbott is doing. She'll cover some of the same background material as me, but there'll be different wines in that tasting. But there's a whole lot of wine out there, so please go um, and enjoy it. And uh, good health. Thank you for coming.